podcasting from Chico, California. This is the Barbless Fly Fishing Podcast, where we discuss fly fishing, guiding, fishery science and management, conservation, and more. No better. Fish better. Learn more at barbless.co. Here's your hosts, Chad Alderson and Nick Hanna. This episode of the Barbless Fly Fishing Podcast is brought to you by California Trout. Working throughout the state to ensure we have resilient wild fish thriving in healthy waters for a better California. Support Caltrout's innovative science-based work by becoming a member or donating today at caltrout.org. Hey, welcome to another episode of the Barbless Fly Fishing Podcast. I'm your host, Chad Alderson. Uh, Nick is in the field today, and I've got uh, my my co-host is going to be the notorious PIG, Piggy Smalls, uh, Hoover, the four-legged farting machine. Yeah, and just, we are going to be interviewing Mr. Hogan Brown. Hey, thanks for having me, Chad. Hogan, welcome to the show. Yeah, it's been a while, but it's good to be back. I know, man. Well, catch us up. What have you been up to? Uh, you know, it's kind of transition time. Uh, most what do you of, mean by transition well, time? Well, just kind of in between, you know, once the, the river here, the sack starts getting blown out and kind of winter storms set in, I kind of move between striper fishing there when the weather is fishable in the sense of the rivers fishable and then uh getting into kind of our winter spotted bass fishing yeah so i had my first spotted bass no my second spotted bass trip yesterday and the fish were definitely feeding better than they were on my first spotted bass (laughs) fishing trip so uh, last year well no no i no um, i had i did one i went out on orville a couple weeks ago um, it was a, a father daughter and the daughter was new to fishing. So that's a pretty easy kind of introduction. And it was, yeah, you know, water temps were still a little high. Fish were not super aggressive once the sun got up on the water and it's kind of early. When you say it was, it was an easy kind of introduction. What, can you talk about the method? You're talking yeah. Yeah. About? We fished the, you know, we fished the float and fly method out there, which, you know, Ryan Williams, who I know you guys have had on a few times, uh, really kind of pioneered and. Chuck Reagan's done a bunch of stuff with it, our buddy Chuck. And uh, it's basically very similar to how guys are fishing pyramid, you know, basically a balanced type of setup with a float or an indicator and, uh, um, you know, basically a bobber. And Cool. And I'm, I'm trying to find the episode that Ryan was on so I can tell you guys, for those that haven't, um, we're still, we're looking here. Oh, that's a, that's a leader. Uh, there it is. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. No. That's no. a leader. No. Where is it? No. Jadicator. All right. Here it is. Here it is. Here it is. Uh, okay. So that's going to be on season two, episode sixty-five, and the uh, the title is called "Float and Fly for Winter Bass." Ryan Williams. We recorded that uh, around this time last year. Yeah. So the, yeah. Because getting everybody ready for that transition, like you were talking. Yeah. About. Yeah. It's kind of that. You know. Once I, I I fish stripers as long as I physically can, but you know when the the winter storms start coming in, the river does blow out. And yeah, you know, yeah. So Ryan, um, on that episode 65, he goes, he breaks this stuff down in detail. So we're not going to spend a ton of time on it. Well, all that, that's all the time we're going to spend on it. Actually, Perfect. But that's what I've been yeah. doing. That's what I've been yeah, doing. So cool. I've kind of been going in between those two right And now. today was, or yesterday was better than the, yeah. Yeah. The, the water temps are down to about 53 and the fish are eating the, the pond smelt and it's going. So if you cool. got access to a, a reservoir, it's a good time to go. Yep, and there's leader formulas on how to do these float and fly uh, rig setups um, on our website, and also I th- believe Jason Cochran with Jadicator. I believe you can buy float and flies from him. Yeah, or yeah, the, the yeah. I, I got I have a few for sale on my website. The Cal Bass Union has them for sale on their website. They're out yeah. there. A lot of fly shops have them. It's pretty yeah. pervasive cool. at this point now. Yeah, have you fl- have you uh, fished his new ones that Chuck posted the other day? Yeah, so um, I guided Jay and his dad this spring and Jay gave me a bunch of the, um, I call them fallover indicators. I don't They're know. kind of like those pencil. Ones, yeah. Right? It, it looks like an old school, um, uh, basically what like a traditional balsa float looks like if you were to buy yeah. one at like a, a bait shop and there, um, I use Jay's ones that we sell and then I use those. And then, uh, I also use, uh, Lance Gray's float. That's a nice one. um, there's a lot of people that are making good floats, but Jay is definitely, you know, his are the thing with Jay's is they last forever. 
yeah he spent a lot of time yeah um you know getting the the lasting yeah. part down right? <laughs> yeah i mean those things i have jadicators from yeah six years seven years ago yeah and if you want to uh we actually had jason on the show um about a year ago around the same time on season three episode uh i think that's 66 right yeah 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 I, my eyes are super blurry today i have this dry eye thing going on <laughs> i gotta go to the optometrist to it's, figure it out it's so fucking annoying dude it's called be, it's called age you well, need, it's, you need that, glasses. It's, it's crazy because i'll be i'll wake up one morning and i got like perfect vision and then the next day I'll wake up and I'm jacked. I can't see anything. Oh, okay. It's really Yeah, weird. no, my eyes are jacked every day. <laughs> no, mine's, <laughs> mine's inconsistent. So I, I've got it narrowed down, you know, on Google to dry yeah. eyes. So there I got to go. go in and, and figure it out because any of the, none of the drops are working. But anyway, I just kind of got into the details in case anybody else has dry eyes out there and is wondering what the <laughs> Call Chad and on. tell him how to fix it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. So that was on season three, episode 66 with Jason Cockrum. It's called Jadicator Balsa Floats. Jay really gets down in the weeds on how he makes those floats. So much so that you could actually do it from home. If you listen to that episode, he just kind of breaks his process down big time. If you so choose to spend your time on a lathe with some. Yeah, you don't want to do that. Wood. Just buy him. Yeah, just buy him. <laughs> anyway yeah uh, what else what else is uh there? just uh starting to fill my boxes with flies you know i got two young boys so yeah. i got them tying flies and you know we're just doing that and then christmas is coming so been getting Are ready you, for uh, that yeah by the time this this one comes to pass it'll probably have already happened yeah yeah you know christmas this, this episode anyway yeah, yeah christmas is in a couple of days yeah um man i'm always busy you well, know we just had the cast hope benefit concert yeah. last weekend and how did that go? It was great. It was, um, you know, we grow the event every year, sold out uh, the evening show and ended up doing a, a matinee show that almost sold out as well. So nice. Yeah. Very you know, nice. so. Um, what did you get the kids? Can you uh, say? Yeah. 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 Um, so we got um, bikes. We got them new bikes because at their age, they need a new bike about every, you know, as often like as they, they need shoes. shoes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> They're, um, they're, they grow they outgrow bikes that fast oh huh? god that's dude. crazy well i mean it's you know you don't think they do but then you look at them and they look like a shriner kid riding around on like a <laughs> you know they like a shriner car and yeah, you're just like yeah, yeah. damn you, you know they're the kid in the like neighborhood the, like the great ape. totally you're they're the kid in the neighborhood and you're just like oh dude i'm sorry you need a new bike bud uh <laughs> So yeah, we got new bikes and then, um, I actually got them. They've been, um, you know, I got a nine and 11 year old and we just started this kind of late summer starting to throw eight, nine weights with shooting heads for stripers. Oh shit. Like they're, Dude, they're we're throwing in the, we're awesome. throwing in the, in the cul-de-sac and they're, you know, they can get it done. Um, we're transitioning from the, from the bait casters to the fly rod. So I got That's them. That's awesome, uh, man. All right. Yeah, so what'd you get them? I got them two eight, new uh, eight weights with reels and shooting heads. Yeah, so they'll the have whole, whole the whole setup. shebang. So. Like, a, what, like a type three? Lines? Yeah, I, 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 so I called uh, one of my rod sponsors and the guys up at Ray Jeff Sports. They do Echo and Airflow. And I mm -hmm. was talking to um, those guys up there that I work with. And I'm like, hey, they're for the kids. Like, what do you think? I mean, I know what I throw in works, but mm -hmm. they, they dialed it all out. He's like, you know, this is a good rod, a little lighter line, a little mm -hmm. different head setup, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, we went with the new couple new eight weights, lamps and water work reels. And then, uh, I forget what line they recommended. It was not one that I w I had thought I would buy, but they said, no, this will cat this will mm. It don't turn over those big flies. Yeah, so you know that's the big thing that it'll take them a while just to turn over those heavy flies. So it's yeah. like you know you're fishing with them; they're fishing a lot of like Puglisi style flies, st basically flies without lead eyes. You know uh, what I mean? I was going to ask you. Would yeah. you say Pugli? Puglisi? Puglisi? Yeah. What is that? Um, gosh, he's he ties. You, this you've is seen a tire him. Thing. Yeah, okay. it's a tire. You've seen his flies. You'll know them. They look like they're kind of. Is Puglisi one word? Or is that his last name? Or you that's his last name. La okay. uh, that's his last name, and I could be totally Pugliese. butchering it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he's a he's. I think he's from Spain. Okay. But if you t if you look up Puglisi fly, you've seen them. They're they're like synthetics, and they kind of trim them to the bait fish profile. Okay. You've seen them. Trust me. Okay. Um. But yeah. So basically, they're throwing flies without lead eyes, and that you know saves me spending the day in the bottom of the boat cowering and. <laughs> Yeah, saves them a little, a yeah. little bit. They get whacked still, but and I assume you pinch all the barbs on the boat. Ah, uh, uh -huh. 
I, you know, Dude, yeah, I should. I should, but I mean, at this point, I mean, I, I, they've been throwing, you know, glide baits the size of their arms on bait casters yeah, without it's a little p- different though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know, man. How did you teach them to double haul? Um, so I. I'm not I, I'm not a really good casting instructor though I I try to be. Um, so you just yell at them until they. No no like I I basically I you know we get in the front yard or in front of the house and I got an old eight weight with a kind of a crappy sh- you know one of my shooting heads that I pulled off my boat rods that's just beat to piss and uh, get them just throwing the head, you know, clamping down on the line, holding it against the rod and just feeling the weight. And then from there I went to, okay, when you feel that head want to go, let go of the line and they start in the forward cast or yeah, in the forward cast. And so they can shoot it. Yeah. And then just getting them to hold the line in their, their both right handed and their off hand. Um, it's actually easier with the shooting head because they they feel the line want to pull, mm-hmm. right? So I I always tell them when you feel that line want to pull, pull it the opposite way to double the acceleration, and they mm-hmm. can kind of figure that out. I basically tell them, you know, when you feel that line pull, separate your hands, and yeah. it's a total coordination thing, you know, like it, teaching anybody. Yeah, but I mean, kids pick kids they, pick they stuff up, up way quicker than adults. Yeah, I mean, I I really kind of got my double haul down earlier this year yeah 2019 yeah. earlier in the in the yeah. year and uh it's not perfect but it's a lot better than it has been you know in any yeah any other year yeah and i taught myself by watching other people that yeah are it, good casters just look saying, at the mechanics go put things in slow motion yeah film your buddy that you go out that you go out with that's filming that's doing is it huge right. yeah and just slow the video down and watch the watch the hand work mm-hmm. and then just kind of you know you know pinch your barbs obviously yeah just yeah uh, there was there's a um, orvis does a real if you just search orvis double haul video orvis excellent video yeah did, have you seen that one yeah, yeah. yeah. that's there's, that's the one i started on yeah it's probably the best one out there like to get my idea of casting i've like yeah. that's what I watched. Yeah, to, to help the kids. I, all, all those Orvis videos, man. Like, oh, I, the Orvis instructional program is huge. They they do a great job. Yeah, um, Tom Rosenbauer was at IFTD as you yes. know. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, when we were doing the um, the presentation for how to, you know, the the podcast masterclass presentation yeah. at IFTD, he was there. He showed up to it. And before we started, I go I go down and I'm like, Mr. Rose, <laughs> I go so fan cool boy on him. Oh, totally. Yeah. And I'm shook his hand. I'm like, it's so cool to meet you, man. I've I've t- I've learned so much from your videos. Yeah. And, and uh, he's just a really nice dude. And, very and humble, very was, good dude. Yeah, it was cool yeah. to just see him in the audience, like you know, with him learning from us. You know, yeah. And the table had like, turned. I feel like I give a little bit back that way, but yeah. you know, oh, he still yeah. got a lot of credit. Totally. So, he's a good dude. Yeah. The dog, we're not even 15 minutes in and the dog. He's tearing him off. He's tearing him off. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he hasn't, it's been raining all day, so he hasn't, he hasn't done number two. So he's got, he's, <laughs> he's got a little a, packed up. Yeah. He's got a jumper. At the door. <laughs> all right. He but, seems comfortable. He seems uh, comfortable. Yeah. yeah. We'll just, we'll suffer through it. <laughs> so what are we, so what are we talking about today, man? Oh, uh, well, we were, we were texting the other day and you were asking if there was any, ideas I had for shows. And I said, you know, everybody's tying flies right now because it's winter. Why don't we do it on tie and flies? Cool. So, um, basically I was just kind of, I, I do a slide presentation for clubs and stuff on tie and flies and kind of talk about my ideas behind flies and stuff. And it's really not my ideas. They're just ideas I picked up from other people. So, you know, talking about just basic is a lot of people go in and start tying flies in the winter, you know, trout season's over, we're home kind of locked down. Um, there's a lot of real simple stuff that I've learned over the years from, I was fortunate enough to spend time around Bob quickly, Quigley before he passed and, um, you know, learn some stuff from Mike Mercer and some of the, some of the big guys, but it's all, you put it all together. It's pretty common sense. You know, is that the end of the show then? No, no, no. <laughs> uh, so uh, basically, uh, you know, my approach to fly tying, if we talk about it, it's pretty simple. Um, you know, and I got it from, Bob Quigley. And he said, if you're gonna, you know, tie flies, you know, the, you got to break it down. And 
I think one of the things when I started meeting some of these guys that, you know, a lot of us look up to and are kind of hollowed tires in the, in, I guess, in fly fishing was, um, you know, you can watch a video and learn how to tie a fly and you can, you know, the, the, I'm jealous of people that, you know, like you that have started tying flies with, you know, freaking YouTube, like that's an, that's a game changer. But a lot of what you don't learn on YouTube, you can learn the step-by-step, step. you can learn how to do something. But this, the part that really makes the great ones great is it's the whys. Why do you do that? Yeah. You know, yeah. why, why do you use that material versus that material? Yeah. Why do you use that color versus that color? Or even, even like how much material you're Absolutely. using. It's very hard Absolutely. to understand on, from watching a YouTube video, exactly how much, you know, you know, density yeah. you're grabbing, you know? So like I always, you know, one of the things that like I've tried to start to teach people or like in the club stuff that I do and talking is stuff is not, in a, I mean, we're in the information age, man. You can learn the hows on your phone right now in a matter of minutes, but the whys are really the, the key that's going to separate a tire from someone who puts together the actual biology of the insects, what's happening, how to imitate it, and then how to fish it. And, you know, I, I kind of got this, I connected with this concept. My wife uh, was an art major and an interior design major. And the amount, I mean, she took, I remember when we were in college, she took two semesters of color theory. Yeah. Like just studying color. And, you know, I started to think about it. It's like, you know, anyone can, well, anyone can go, you know, copy a Picasso, but like most great artists understand their palette of colors, like no one else, you know, how do you mix this and this to get that? Like most great photographers understand light. Yes. They understand their equipment, their hardware very well. And then they understand composition. Yeah. So when I got to hang out with some of these great tires over the years, it's like, I was I was all about the whys. It was not like I can learn how to tie your flies. And that's really what it's the information that's not out there right now. You know what I mean? Like you Mm -hmm. said, like you can watch YouTube and, you know, learn how to tie a parachute atoms, but you know, why is that body tapered? Why do you use, you know, Antron dubbing versus natural hair dubbing? Why do you, you know, because a lot of Quigley's flies and Quigley was one of my big inspirations. It's like, if you look at them, many of them look like, you know, a hairball out of a cat, some of them. And you're like, but then you fish it and you're like, or you listen to Bob when he was alive, explain, Oh, this is why. And you're like, Oh my God, that's genius. You know, to the point of like, well, this is here because this is where you apply the float and you don't apply the float and back here. You don't do that. You know, so you're <laughs> yeah, like, Oh my Jesus. gosh. Okay. So, you know, as we, is, is I break it down, I always break it down to people is, you know, know why you're doing what you're doing you know, everything has a purpose, you know, every material has a characteristic, you know, a painter knows his palette, know your materials, you know? And so when I, when I first start, you know, talking to people that are, you know, learning how to tie flies or getting interested in flies, like look in a fly shop and look around the material, become familiar with the material. That's your palette, right? Like that is what you're going to imitate an insect with, like understand how it moves, you know, don't understand. You know, what's funny about too, is the same type of concept. You know, you watch people look at flies, especially dry flies. They always look at them like from a side profile, they hold it up and look at it sideways. Like a fish is never going to see that mm-hmm. sideways. It's like, how does it look underneath? You know, look mm-hmm. from a nymph. How does a nymph look as it turns, you know, um, just little simple tricks like that of changing your mindset of like from just creating a fly to actually using the medium of a hook and material to imitate a fly. It's a big shift in like a tying idea. Yeah. I also didn't think about just our, um, our bias from our perspective, our vantage point bias that we have, right? Where, Oh, absolutely. If we're not looking up from underwater, that's where you, that's where your vantage point needs to be when you're thinking about. Yeah. And understanding how the environment that the fish is in changes their perception of a fly. You know, like I had, you know, I can't tell you how many times I said it or, you know, 
was sitting in a drift boat or the jet boat or something and you know we're changing a, a fly from brown to olive or you know one that has a flashback that doesn't and people are like why does that matter i'm like it's all perspective of scale right like if your cheeseburger is all of a sudden green you're gonna notice yeah and not eat it <laughs> you know yeah. if a trout's eating mayflies and all of a sudden one comes at him and it's not the right color he's not gonna eat it i always use bar analogies <laughs> if, if it ate Eight brunettes walk in, and then <laughs> yeah, so totally. the and you're like, "Oh, yeah." So, you know, when I when I break it down for people, it's like that. That you know, the I really think one of the things that all tires should do is if they're really, you know, if they're really looking at kind of jumping to the na- the next level, is like learn the palette, right? So, go into the fly shop and tie flies with marabou, tie flies with this, tie flies. And I mean, just wrap that stuff on a hook and put it in water and see what it looks like. Yeah. That's, you what, know what, I that's mean? what I was going to ask you. Like if you're in, if you're in the fly, you know, you're in a fly store, fly shop, and you're trying to, you know, get a little bit more intimate with these materials. Um, they're wrapped in plastic. What do you do? Can you, yeah, is it, I mean, what, it, what's it, the, what's the, most people, most people yeah. at the jump level we're talking about, like, you know, they've done the YouTube thing. They can tie flies, right? Yeah. Start understanding why you use certain materials. Like if, you know, you ask, th- there's a lot of really good, you know, if you look, you know, why marabou? Why do, why do people use marabou? Well, it moves with minimal amount amount of motion applied to it. You know, it, it can be moved slow, but have lots of motion. You know, the old thing of, you know, I remember learning at one time, you know, Jay Fair's wiggle tail. It's like, that's a really popular lake pattern. Well, it, it looks like a leech pulsating, standing still. Like it can move standing still in hmm. the water, you know? Marabou um, is just awesome for... Yeah, for you know, marabou does all sorts of stuff. You know, palmered marabou looks great as mayfly gills because the fibers are really short, but they move, you know. Um, when you start looking at a lot of nymph dubbings, it's like they're stiff fibers. Like they take up bulk and they don't move, yeah. you know. Um, all sorts of different stuff, you know, like, you know, PT versus ostrich or, you know, all these different things, you know, that what's, you st- what's PT for the new guys? Oh, like a pheasant tail, yeah. you know, or, uh, you know, if you're going to use ostrich versus pheasant tail or, you know, peacock curl versus ostrich, what's the, you know, what's the benefits, pros and cons? What do they look like? What do they do? You know? When, yeah. And, and that you're totally right. Cause this stuff isn't really talked about on YouTube to, to no, large YouTube, extent. It's, it's very much how, yeah. you know, so where do you go? You know, and that's, I, I, you know, I, I mean, all my knowledge was, you know, and we can go through kind of the stuff I've learned, you know, basically bug by bug, but like most of the stuff I learned was by talking to these guys, yeah. you know, and it, it, you know, the, the beauty of the fly fishing world is everyone's pretty dang friendly. You know what I mean? And it's like, it, it, I get messages all the time. How do you do this? It's like, most good tires, like, you know, I mean, Mercer's, if you ask Mercer why he does this, he will tell you exactly why you do it. Everything yeah. is very, there's no chance. Like, yeah, that episode we did with him was Yeah, was it's like awesome. there's no like, oh, well, I liked that color. It's like there is a reason. You yeah, know what he, I mean? he talks about triggers a lot. He, exactly. he Triggers came up again and again and again. And, you know, let, can you talk about triggers from your perspective first? Yeah, uh, so. Wrap a definition around it and then give some examples. So uh, one of my, it, it kind of leads into probably the, the biggest piece of advice I ever give people. And, and Bob Quigley said it to me is, you know, if you are trying to tie flies, no matter what pattern it is, be able to imitate the silhouette, like nail the silhouette then add everything else. So like Bob's thing was if you can't tie a pheasant tail that nails the silhouette of the mayfly you're tying, you don't need to add crystal flash, a flashback, epoxy, a redhead, like yeah. nail the silhouette. Tie a butterface. Right? You know, yeah. tie tie nail the silhouette of what you're trying to imitate because that I mean that's that's it, right? Like it has to look like the bug. You know, and then what Mike Mercer does incredibly well and really is his like, I think the big thing that Mike figured out of all the time he spent at the vice and fishing is 
okay, once I nail the silhouette, what are the pieces that I add to that to make that silhouette stand out from the other silhouettes? That trigger, that thing Mm -hmm. that makes that fish look at that bug, not the other hundred, and go, I'm eating that one. You know, and, you know, his whole line of trigger nymphs was, you know, a little flash on the top, you know, a little copper bead, a little, you know, if you look at the back of like a micro mayfly, he splits it with a very fine piece of flash, you know, but then at the same time, if you ask him, like, I remember one time, you know, why, why such a thin piece of flash on the back of a mayfly nymph? Oh, well, because as the air pocket builds within the nymphal shuck and that wing case begins to break, the middle between the wings is a lighter color. It's like, Jesus, there's just purpose, right? Yeah. That's yeah. why the flashback. Intention. On the, yeah. Intention. That's why the flashback mm-hmm. on the micro may is thin. That's not why it's a normal, like what we would think of as a flashback on a PT. So it's like, you know, the trigger is the thing that it, it, it's the flash. It's the, you know, what do you add to, you know, make the fish key to that? And, you know, I'm not a, I, I'm not a big trigger guy i tend to think of it is you know what do i add to the fly once i have the silhouette to make the fish eat my fly like i believe like what i learned from bob was like i should be able to take everything away from my fly the the cool flash the nice dubbing the whatever and the fish should eat the fly just based on silhouette just based on nailing it yeah you know and if it doesn't eat the silhouette or the basic fly, adding a bunch of shit to it, it's not going to make it eat. Okay. That, that was kind of that's how I that's how I come at designing flies. When you um when you're working on these silhouettes, it's easy to find what they look like online. Yeah, but scale though is always tough. Yeah. So did you go out in the field and like basically yeah, you entomologist know, and, I, and I I grew up you know as I always say I grew up as an only child on sixteen acres with nothing to do so um, I snorkeled a lot I spent a lot of time in the water but I mean a lot of it's just walking the bank turning over bugs yeah. and looking at rocks you know it's I when I used to teach a lot of fishing and I, I don't so much anymore is it's like I always tell people like y- you should before you do anything, before you ever cast, unless you, you know, you're on a river, you fished a hundred times or something like take some, take some time to look around. Like the world that you are entering in that river will tell you what you need to do. You know, turn over the rocks. They'll tell you what bugs are in there. They'll tell you what flies. Yeah. You know, I do. That's uh, that I can't, that can't stress that point enough of just, yeah. especially on walk and wade trips. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, because you can, you know, if you're doing streamer fishing, it's it's a different kind of thing. You're just, absolutely you, if if you can if you're mobile enough, you like stick and move. But mm-hmm. if you're gonna hang out in a certain spot, I always roll in and not fish for a second and just kind of like be quiet, take things in, look at what's totally. coming off the water, look at the it, r- it, bird situation. And, and it's not just stuff. trout fishing, man. I mean, it's like it, is my world has gone into more bass and striper fishing and stuff like that. Is it's like you still do it. It's like you, I still, you know, yesterday on the water, it's like, I, you know, you're blasting 40 miles across 40 miles an hour across the lake, you kill the throttle. You're like, all right, let's go, you know, let's yeah. go. But I always have to force myself to not do that and be like, okay, turn on the fish finder, look at the water temps, yep. you know, pay attention to the graph. Like don't yeah. blow in, you know, it's that, yeah. Whatever it is, as we enter into the natural world, whether it's, you know, on a 20 foot boat into a spot on a lake or, you know, we're walking up to a spring creek. It's like, take the moment to notice what's around. Don't be arrogant enough to think yeah. that you already got it figured out. Yeah. And when, <laughs> when you're like, you know, when you're, uh, you, you cut your engine or you stop walking and the gravel stops crunching and there's that, that moment of just dead silence. Oh, absolutely. That just gets your head in the space of just being yeah. present. Yeah. At that point. It, yeah. It, it, um, I always tell people, especially trout fishing, cause I used to teach a lot of people how to fish the lower Yuba and it was like, you know, the river's going to tell you what to do, you know, turn yeah. over the rocks, look in the bushes, look on the banks, watch the fish, you know? Um, and that's kind of, that kind of, you know, you relate that back to your question is like to, you know, could you paint a sunset if you'd never seen a sunset? No. So like, how can you expect to tie a really good PMD nymph if you've never actually like looked at a PMD nymph, you know, 
Yeah, so, that's a fair point. You know, and that's kind of how I looked at it when I was really like just hungry to come up with flies and just diving into this is it's, you know, the good tires understand and connect the dots between their, what they're trying to imitate, the palette with which they have to create it, and then what they're actually going to do on a hook, you know? Yeah. It's got me thinking about what you're saying about like guide flies versus, you know, shop flies, right? Oh, totally. And, and the guide fly is going to look bad it will oh, look absolutely. bad but the but the yeah because they're they're trying to blast as many through yeah oh yeah it's their job right yeah um, no i it, but <laughs> i guarantee you that the 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 um the silhouette's probably going to be as good if not better than the shop fly oh absolutely i mean right. you got to think with it with the business of fly tying you have you know people tying commercially that have never seen a pmd nymph yeah and we're talking nymphs like yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah 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 i mean yeah. really anything too i mean if you look that's one thing that, you know, I always tell people when they're tying flies is it's like less is more, right? Like yeah. y- y- you have no, most bugs like that you're trying to imitate with trout flies are no bigger than the shank of the hook. Like you don't need to put much on it. Yeah. Like keep it trim, you know, um, even stone fly nymphs. I mean, most of our stone flies are very, very trim, you know, and, um, you know, less is more. And, and that's where the disconnect comes. If you, if you, and that's what I always tell people, if you've only seen commercially tied flies, like flies tied in a fly shop, like that's not necessarily the bar with which you need to hit. Like that's not always the best example of a good PMD or a good pheasant tail. Like, you know, start looking and there's a lot of fly shops that have good custom tied flies and stuff. And there's a lot of great commercially tied flies, but like, like you said, look in a guides box, you know, look yeah. at the, the really good guy in the fly club who ties yeah. flies. And, and there's also so many guides that, that tie in their off season that are selling their flies on. Instagram. Oh, there's a ton. There's and a ton. I, I try personally, if I'm, if I'm not on a time crunch, uh, I yeah. try to get my flies from guides that are, that tie in the area. Yeah, absolutely. Because they know that they know the local, you know, a lot of these flies are coming from China, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, if you try and you're trying to localize your, localize your fly box, you buy from local tires. Oh, I mean, absolutely. And right. that's, I'll, I'll be honest. I mean, that's one of the, the benefits of being in California is there's a lot of California tires that yep. have contracts with big companies. Yeah. You know what I mean? You, most people don't realize, like, if you think about Mike Mercer, Ken Morish, myself, Bob Quigley, like, being in Northern, Cal- Northern California and be able to walk into a fly shop and buy Mike Mercer's flies, like, you serious? Like, that's... If you live in North Dakota, like I'm sure the big fly tire is not cranking them out for the local fly shop in that type of quality and right, quantity, right. you know? So it's, we're pretty spoiled to have so many good tires from our area and our state. And anglers. And anglers, you know, um, to be able to share the, you know, what they come up with. So. Dog just cracked one off again. Yeah. Is he? He's kind of pointed at both of us, kind of right in the middle. He's he's not moving though. He's yeah, comfortable. He's indiscriminately yeah dropping yeah, yeah, bombs yeah. like Blitzkrieg. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, I, I basically when I when I look at like kind of helping people jump to the next level, I always kind of break it down like caddis, stoneflies, mayflies, right? And like what I learned, you know, I always look at people when I talk about a caddis, you know, like one thing I always tell people is one thing about caddis patterns is how many caddis patterns are one single color. Yeah. That's what I was going to ask you about colorways and how many. So, you know, the caddis is the, you know, there's, I can kind of go through, I'll go through the color on the different bugs. And is it seasonal? You know, I, I, I would never pretend to have an entomologist idea or knowledge of bugs, but, you know, one thing I, I started noticing and it, all mine's like amateur or armchair, I guess, biologists is, you know, when I was, a when I was a kid, it was, you know, the, uh, you know, bird's nest, a bird's nest was what you fished for a caddis, yeah. you know, yeah, and you pull caddis out from under the rocks and you look at caddis pupa and the, and you're like, there's so many different hues and colors as light hits this and I'm fishing a 
basically an olive turd, mm. you know, like, and then, you know, one of the things you look at, like the revolutionary flies that came out kind of when I was, I guess, a kid or young, like Mike Mercer's Z-Wing Caddis. Okay. Like there's many things I don't even, I'm not even sure people fish that fly anymore, but it was like, Hey, you know what? The caddis is darker on top than it is overneath. So we're going to pull some, you know, turkey quill over the top. And if you look at like a rockworm or a caddis pupa, you're like, oh yeah, it's darker on the top than it is on the sides. And then you make a dark head because like an olive rockworm has a black head. You're like, oh wow. Okay. So, and then you take kind of the next evolution of a caddis, you know, and you look at, uh, Timmy Fox's pattern. It's like, it's crystal flash underneath on the shank because wow, it's lighter underneath, you know? And so what I started to learn was it's like, you know, bugs, light refracts off color differently. Okay. So I've always believed, and I learned this from Bob that color gives depth or three dimension to the fly. Okay. So if just your, your olive bird's nest is floating down, it's flat, right? It's one color lights hitting it and refracting Mm -hmm. off in the same way. So it doesn't look alive. It doesn't look three dimensional. It doesn't looks like an olive turd floating down the river. And you started to see people tying with variegated stuff, you know, uh, Mike and Tim started doing different styles and more detailed caddis patterns. I mean, when the, when the Fox Poopa hit the lower sack, it was like we invented dynamite. I mean that it still fishes and it was insane when that thing hit. And because I always believed it was a more accurate, it was a better hammer, you know, it was an invention that made the hammer better. And that color by adding those darks and lights, I think it creates, and this is my theory, I think it creates more of a three-dimensional silhouette for the fish to see, you know, because most of the time, you know, whether you're nymph fishing or dry fly fishing, the fish is looking up into a brighter environment than they are in. So what they are essentially seeing is a silhouette out against that lighter environment. So if the color is just flat, olive, the silhouette is not as distinguished, you know, but if you can create a color scheme in that fly that can present a more three-dimensional or better silhouette, then I think color starts to play a big part of it. And those two patterns with, with Mercer Z-Wing, and then if, you know, years later, Tim's uh, Fox Poopa, those changed the game when those came out, because they were the first caddis patterns that I remember in my life that like really took that different color approach versus the like it's an olive rock one do you um you know for your own box your i wouldn't say like a guide box but for you know someone that's just doing a walk and way trip with them and their buddy mm-hmm. um in terms of the, the different hues or colorways or however you want to you want to put it mm-hmm. um it sounds like they need to, they're more colors good um but yeah it, do they do you go down the spectrum or how do you you know i, I like if you if you look at my fly patterns that are out there you know, like the S and M, the S and M, I basically took that same idea and was like, you know, Hey, a a mayfly nymph is darker on top than it is over the the bottom. It never made sense to me. Like when I started looking at it, I'm like, we're putting these bright flashbacks over mayflies. And that is the darkest part of a mayfly nymph is it's dark black wing case. Why would we do that? And so I was like, well, I'm going to put dark wing cases on, you know, super trim mayfly nymphs. And it was like, holy cow, that works. You know, um, if you look at any of my flies, like I tend to carry usually about three color variations, depending on the, you know, whether it's a, a dry or a nymph, really, I, I carry like an olive, um, something lighter, like a creamy tannish, and then maybe a brown. And, you know, that's pretty much for most of our rivers, that's pretty much what you can get it done with, Mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, people swear that they'll eat a brown mayfly over an olive mayfly. And I guess sometimes it's more for me, I, I, I think sometimes it makes a difference, but I, I think, you know, most, if you look at, if you take most fly tying materials that are brown and you get it wet, it looks olive. So like yeah. I'm always like brown or olive. I don't, I don't. Is it a make a difference? Maybe. When um, <laughs> when 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 we're thinking about thread to tie these flies, yeah. What um, 
what brand of thread do you use? Do you recommend um, one? And you, then what colors do you use? Do you go? Do you have like a white thread, and then you you hit it with ink, or do you have no? So threads? I one of my things that you know, and it, it's a good question because that kind of plays in. I think probably one of my signature things that I do is I I I use thread as a material. You know, if you look at the S and M, if you look at my military mayflies, if you look at any of my flies, like some component of the body of the fly is thread. And you like use thread to build up the body, is what you're saying? Yeah, and it's it kind of goes back to um, something I learned from Bob. And when Bob started talking about silhouettes, and I started pulling these, you know, little mayfly, little betas, and PMDs, and all this stuff out of the U, I'm like, these things are thin you know, I don't even really need dubbing, you know? And so I started using wire and thread to create the profile that I wanted. And that was a portion. I mean, that's the fly probably way more durable too. I don't know if it's any more durable, but it's, you know, it's quicker to tie when you got to tie, you know, six or seven of them a night and you know, it's cheaper. And so I tend to use when I'm tying trout flies, I want to use the thinnest thread possible. Like I use eight aught you know, uni thread for pretty much every trout application because it just anything I can do to keep that fly trim, you know, cause we, as tires, I think it's even, you know, I tie every day and it's easy to use too much material yeah. and, um, you know, passes of the thread up and down the hook shank being very minimal about that, you know, and doing that, you know, a dot thread builds a thinner fly if you have to do that. And, you know, so, yeah, that, I think when you're first tying, that's one of the hardest things is, yeah. is oh. to know, uh, when, when is when, 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 <laughs> yeah. when, efficiency. when enough wraps, efficiency of application, how many whip yeah. finishes to do yeah. oh, without for sure. it, like, you know, spooling off the front of the, the, yeah. the, the eye you yeah know, stuff like that yeah and i it so when you ask about thread what do i use i use a dot for pretty much all my trout Everything. fishing and then i own i would say probably every color of uni thread okay if there's a new color uni uh, thread, do you I not use it. vivas i don't i use i i'm kind of behind the times i guess i just started using vivas for some of my striper stuff yeah that's you know? what i use it for striper, yeah but, it, but it's the shit's like it's like piano wire man. yeah and i <laughs> And I think I like it for my um, for my striper stuff. One thing I've noticed that it's not. I like my trout stuff. I like about the uni thread is it it, it has grip, like right. it grips materials. Vivas doesn't. It's kind of no, it's, it's kind of waxy. Snotty. It's kind of waxy. Yeah. So like if you, I think it would be very hard to learn how to tie trout flies with that because, you know, say you're trying trying to tie in a, a tail on top of the hook shank. And, you, you know, you want to give it a wrap and a wrap. It, it's not going to bite and pinch that yeah. material to the hook shank. It's going to spin it. You know, um, I'd imagine a hair wing with Vivas would be incredibly hard for a beginner or a, even an intermediate or yeah. heck, even me. Uh, so uh, I think it's great for the piano wire portion of it is nice for tying on lead eyes to the, yeah. you know, a four out jig hook, but I tend to over tighten too and break, <laughs> break the, you know, yeah, it's, you know, sensitivity. There's a little bit of learning to use tension, you know, and when to apply tension I'm when tying things is, yeah, that's, and I mean, it's, I'm good at it with the flies. I tie a lot, but it's the thing that I find that if you're not tying the fly a lot, you become out of practice the quickest. Yeah, that's a if you if you watch a lot of fly tying videos, you can really tell who's been tying longer just by watching the video, and you can put it on mute and just watch watch their mechanics. You oh, know? absolutely, and and just the dexterity that they have, and confidently knowing exactly how many. Oh, yes. I'm gonna do three here. Yeah, like if you watch Phil Rowley stuff. Oh, Jesus. Dude, yeah, this guy. That's yeah. exactly what I'm saying. Is like he could probably tie a pretty intricate fly with his eyes closed. I'm oh, I, I mean, sure. you're looking at, I mean, that's like, I mean, Phil Rowley's like, you know, that's like the Michael Jordan of fly tying. You yeah. Know? It's, if you guys haven't watched any of, of, uh, Rowley's videos, man, um, definitely get on his YouTube channel. And oh subscribe. yeah. If you want to be humbled. Yeah. yeah. Especially if you, if you're trying to do lake flies, balance leeches, things like that. Oh yeah. It's yeah. just a treasure trove. Well, and the cool thing about his flies is too, a lot of them are incredibly simple. 
that's you know, what's so killer about it. They're man. incredibly like his simple. balance leeches are super easy to tie and they're super effective. Yeah. Balance yeah. leech on a lake is my number one. Oh yeah. Go-to. Yeah. 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 There's, that's the, that's the thing is I, that's the kind of guy that I would want to be like, why? Yeah, why this color? Why that? Uh, you know, we had him on, but he called in, and I would have loved to have him here in person. You know, yeah, 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 yeah. And that's I'm those are the kind of guys that, like, when you watch them on YouTube, you're like, "Wow, I can learn how to do this." But like, there's so much in that guy's mind that go into, you know, because any good fly tire like that, there's a problem, there's a situation that they find as an angler, and that they solve in their head and what you are watching is you are watching the back end of that entire thought process yeah that's a really good way to think about it you know and that's and that's for me man it's like i want to know what what, what, how how did you get from here to there because that's the genius right like yeah that's the genius that's what separates you know those that what the what it is is Ten thousand hours. Yeah, I, I don't know. I I just I always want to know. Yeah. Like I, I well, mean, it, it, the same thing like with Hal Jan, Jansen. Oh he, yeah, he showed me. He's I've been fortunate enough to have hands on his fly boxes and and gone through them with a fine th- mm-hmm. tooth comb. And the thing about these guys that that I would say the elite tires. Yeah. Every single, you know, he's got a little minnow. He he ties this minnow that's just fucking ridiculously <laughs> deadly. Yeah. And every single one that he ties is just perfect. It's it's like an art form for him, you know. And, and oh, in yes. his house, he's got all of his art and everything. So I just yep. know it translates right over. And so it's a very much a creative endeavor for them, just as much as it is the fishing part of it. That's I, funny. That's I almost funny. put yeah. them in the same category of like the the people that tie the uh, you know the. The, those crazy flies that don't ever fish. What it, oh yeah, like you know. the artistic Atlantic salmon flies. Yeah, and stuff exactly, like that. exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a much, it's a much more straightforward tie. But it, the, all the, I think all the the creativity and the juice is still there. Oh, you know? for sure. It, it's funny you say that because when I I learned how to tie, I think I was, I don't know, I was pretty young, but I didn't really take it. I was basically banging around on my own tying flies, and then. I started hanging out at a, the fly shop in town and I met um, the guy that owned it, Mike Fisher, and then uh, really a legendary tire that many people have probably fished his flies and not even known it, but Ralph Wood. And Ralph was, he's softened up. He's a really nice guy now, but he was pretty curmudgeon back then. And, but takes the art form incredibly serious. He's a real student of the art, you know, um, knew Hal Bird really well, kind of a Bay Area kind of guy. And like when these two guys were teaching me, it was, there was, this was, it was regimented. It was like, I didn't learn it. Their whole thing was you tie. I remember the first fly they showed me to tie both Ralph and Mike was a El Caracatus. Okay. And it was like, until I could tie 12 El Caracatus that all looked the same and all had the correct proportions, I didn't tie anything else. Yeah. And it was regimented. Yeah, would would you would you agree like one one thing that the like the elite tires all have in common is like mentally they're very organized. Yeah. Even if they're even if their workspace isn't. Oh, they are articulate. They're, like they're me- anyone they have reasons for everything. Yeah. Like any little minutia that you ask about, yes. you know, they they ha it's already been thought about and they have a justification for it. Totally. And that's, you know, I even worry about that with getting on a podcast and talking about fly tying because I, I, I am, I, I'm completely into it, anal about it, know, analyze everything. And very few people, I wonder if they even care, you know what I mean? But I, I think people that want to get better at it do, but yeah. Oh, the, you ask, you know, why did you grab the hackle at that angle? Oh, because, yeah. you know, well, I, I think, also, you know, all these things we're talking about with this this obsessive attention to detail. Yes, on, on that's a, that's a really clean way to put it. These yeah. things, all these characteristics and these disciplines that you that you kind of cultivate when when you're doing this aspect of the sport, they they can they translate over into very in a, in a lot of different other areas of your life. They can oh absolutely professionally, personally, absolutely. You know, if you if you look at it that way, and this is one of the reasons, another reason why I like the sport so much. It's just well, and I, I'm there's a, just another layer to that onion that you totally. don't think about. And I and I'm a strong believer that the difference between great anglers and 
like recreational anglers is the connection between what you're doing with a fly and the skill of casting and fishing. You know, a lot of people go into a fly shop and buy what they're told to buy and then go out and fish. Yeah. And, you know, it's, I always use the analogy of like, there's great painters that can paint things, but the great ones spend a lot of time looking at what they're going to paint before they paint it. You know what I mean? And like the great anglers that I've known are the guys that understand everything in that fly from the minute feather that the head's made out of to the cast and men that it's going to need to make it look real in the riffle and why, you know, it's the, Mm -hmm. it's the fullness of the connection. You know, it's, you know, when I, when I was, you know, you talked to, I don't remember having Ralph show me how to tie his squala pattern and the process of catching a fish on that pattern starts from mixing the dubbing you know, Mm -hmm. to creating the correct color for the Yuba River Squala to understanding once that fly is completed, what tippet to put it on and then what cast to make and how to move that, you know, it is the entirety of the process. And I think the the guys that really get into into fly fishing, it's this whole closed loop gratification. Oh God, is it? Yeah. That that people dig you know and and i think that's an aspect of this sport that's unlike most yes i would agree 100 percent. maybe maybe rock climbing's up there too just because if you if you uh you know you miss you could die (laughs) yeah nobody's dying but you know i i I think that probably a rock a rock climber in terms of their intention you know all the the things they think about their how long do they stare at that rock they probably think about the length of their fingernails everything a little totally little aspect of it right just watching that one that one uh documentary that they that where they what he summited like the oh yeah 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 yeah. that that, i saw a lot of parallels between rock climbing yeah and and fly fishing from that aspect of just the just the whole just the, the, the intention behind yeah. every, every movement that that yeah. guy makes up the, up yeah. the side of the, the face of the mountain. And that's, know? that's always with fly tying too, is people always yeah. like, uh, you know, I have friends like, Oh, I want to come tie flies with you. Hey, you know, why do you, but it's like, how much do you really want to know? <laughs> you know what I mean? You yeah, really exactly. want to know? Or do you're you like what you just have the Morpheus talk? <laughs> yeah, basically. It totally. I don't want to go left or right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Red or blue. Yeah. So, yeah, so I mean, the, the, a lot of those are good questions. I mean, I, I would, the amount of stuff and materials that are out there for fly tires now, and it, it yeah, is... Yeah, talk about that for a second, because you've kind of been through the, the the evolution of it. Yeah, you know, when I when I got into tying flies, like, I mean, sh- gosh, that's probably 25 years ago, it was like, I remember, you know, when synthetics really first came out, you know, like synthetic dubbing, um you know, I remember, I remember the big one. I remember when ice dub came out, when hairline released ice, hairline released ice dub. It was like, we thought we were, you know, throwing meth on our flies, and we were just, <laughs> you know, clean up, you yeah. know, and, um, new materials, it, it's almost with the amount of colors and materials and, um, the stuff that's out there, it is, it is mind numbing. You know, if you look through the hairline catalog or the Wapsie catalog or the stuff that Matt, Matt Calise is doing with loon, it's, um, with the resins. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just, I mean, some of the stuff they're doing with color and it, it, it's almost harder because there's so much there that how do you ever really use any of it effectively? You know, and, and I, I always go back to the, the, the piece of advice, Bob, quickly that I will remember my whole life is like, it's silhouette. Yeah. Silhouette. Yeah. Silhouette. It's inter- yeah. Like a lot of the new <laughs> material science that's coming out is, is finding its way into fly fishing. And, oh, absolutely. And what it does with color and how it refra- refracts light and things like that's really interesting. Yeah. There's a, it, you know, there's, there's literally some of the stuff light hits and it looks like a rainbow. Oh, it's insane. Yeah. I, I, you know, and I, I, I buy it all. I mean, I'm a, yeah. you know, it's like I walk well, into, you know, it's where it, at the end of the day, your, you know, your fly, your fly bench is kind of like a Barbie doll. You oh, dude, it's, you know, I, I look at the, I just, 
I just made an air, a hairline order and it was like, I, I had a very specific list that I needed. And then I open up to, you know, the new catalog and I'm like, ah, fuck, take you, my money. You got Costco. Yeah. I you went in like, for yeah, some fucking like, eggs and you yeah, came out with, like, with a big overstuffed teddy bear. That'll be $300. I'm like, fuck. So no, the new, the new materials out there is, um, I would say, you know, the biggest thing is the synthetics have really changed the game. You know, the application of synthetic materials to fly tying yeah. and then the combination of synthetics with naturals and vice versa has, you know, blown the lid off things. You know, it's like, you know, in a lot of striper flies, you can use, you know, yak hair and elk hair, which are very natural fibers and have great properties. But then you can add a little Ferrar blend in there to give it an insane look that you could never get with a, you know a uh, a natural material you know it's yeah. rabbit hair is a great you know chopped up's a great dub but then you throw a little you know antron flash in there and you have an even amazing dubbing you know it's i think the ability to combine naturals and synthetics is really where really where the benefit of new materials is yeah you know um yeah, the my th- this is kind of a de- double edged sword for me, and may, maybe a little controversial, but because I'm sure that just you know floral carbon in the water is enough. But <laughs> I all these the striper flies and everything, and we tie with a lot of synthetics. Every time I put, every time one comes off, I'm like damn, all that, all that oh plastic. yeah, no, that's that's down there. Yeah. yeah, um, you know my striper flies, I really, I probably, I don't, I probably tie with maybe. S- 60% natural fibers. You know, I use a lot of uh, yak hair, a lot of uh, uh, bucktail. Um, because the thing, when you when you start looking at like striper flies and synthetics, um, you know, and striper flies are silhouette too, man. I mean, it's all about silhouette because silhouette dictates yeah. uh, how much water is pushed. That's the first way a striper interacts with your fly is the pressure wave, you know. Um, the thing with synthetics and striper flies is to build bulk and silhouette you have to add material with synthetics. There's very few synthetics that actually keep a stiff body or stiff shape like bucktail. That'll hold the profile when you're That'll hold the profile. So to create bulk with synthetics, you have to add material. Yeah. And that makes for a really tough to cast fly a lot of times. And I, um, I tie this bluegill fly fly and with, and it's all synthetics. Yeah. But I use, on the body i dub it with with mm-hmm. with like is it crystal flat no it's 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 um the chenille crystal chenille crystal so, chenille yeah right that's like a i don't know eighth of an inch mm-hmm. it's so it's big yeah. it's bigger than say a large chenille, yeah larger chenille yeah. but i hit that on the body first and it yeah. just it creates kind of like this a pocket yeah a yeah. pocket and then you just kind of Absolutely. do that load it up front right behind the eyes and then tie everything in above it and it just kind of you know, sperm, mm-hmm. it makes it look like a sperm in the yeah, water. Yeah, absolutely. And it also gives a little body, and when the wa- when the light comes through it, it looks interesting. You know. Oh and, yeah, and and it, that's been doing really well on bass. Yeah, and I, I bluegill Not, like, are probably the one flies. of the hardest flies to tie because of the the profile of the body. Yeah. The yeah. only way to do that is just bulk of material. Yeah, but, and you and there's a diminishing returns. You add too much bulk, and then it's just heavy and cast like shit so the, yeah. that this this like chenille underbody mm-hmm. is a good way because it's like there's you're not using a lot of material yeah but it still pushes it out bulbous enough to give it that that full body that you need you know yeah i started tying i tie most of my striper flies most of them are on a like a yak hair base and i started doing that probably 15 years ago and then like you couldn't buy yak hair and so I kind of learned how to do some stuff with synthetics. But in the last couple of years, um, at first it was Spirit River and then Hairline bought Spirit River. But Spirit River had a source for yak hair. Um, the other one that guys use a lot that's similar to yak hair is wig hair. Um, wig hair? Yeah, wig hair. Um, like it's, that goes on a human? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, okay. yeah. Like if you talk to old striper guys, um, a lot of old... I don't say old, but like older than me, guys that tie striper flies using wig hair is like that's a that's a thing. Going to the wig shops and buy all sorts of wig it's hair. Rippy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it has it, but the thing about it is it's it's stiff. 
You right, can build a profile right, with right, it. Right. Like it's the same benefit of yak hair. Like, you know, it doesn't collapse under pressure of water, you know? And so, um, and there's something to be said for not just piling, you know, slinky flash on, you know? Um, and two, I've, I, it, it's, there's ways to create and mix them. And I, I think that's really the, the, the artistic thing in creating flies, whether you're talking about striper flies or trout flies is the blending of natural with synthetic. I need you to know? do more of that myself. Cause right now I'm just using all synthetics. And, yeah. And you know. it's, it, you know, the, the master, the master of that is Mercer. You know, when you talk triggers, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Like, um, Mercer and I, I would never pretend to understand the mind of Mac, Mike Mercer, but he, he is always through the evolution of his fly tying from what I have seen is, and I don't know, it, him and Quigley, I think we're buddies, but I never have asked Mike if he, if this was, you know, his kind of thought, but like most of Mercer's fry, flies are spot on silhouette, like spot on. And then there's those little things he adds that he would call triggers. I think mm-hmm. that's what he mm-hmm. calls them, but it's that little piece of flash, that little, you know, mixed in Antron to this natural dubbing that just pop it a little bit, you know? Yeah. Can you hear what this dog, what's he doing? Is he, is he gurping on his feet? Oh yeah. He's chewing on his feet. <sighs> Personal hygiene's important. Yeah, he's just going to be difficult tonight. <laughs> well, you made me write down something about five, you said five minutes ago. Yeah. And it was, um, it was having, it was basically, we were talking striper flies and we were talking about, um, stripping flies. Yeah. You talked about the pressure wave. Yeah. That's the first time that's come up. We've talked about pushing water before and that's been mentioned on the show, but pressure wave is new. Um, I assume it's the same, it's, it's related. So let's talk about that a little bit. And I think we start with the biology of the fish. Yeah. So a line on the fish. So I don't know if I've told you this, but it was, Gosh, it was probably 10 years ago. I had a guy in my drift boat. We were fishing trout on the lower sack. And I was just getting into striper fishing. I was kind of guiding maybe a month or two a year for stripers and really trying to build that up. It was maybe 10, 15 years ago. I forget. Um, But the guy had brought out a friend from the East Coast. And this guy's friend from the East Coast was a fisheries biologist in Virginia. And he had just done his PhD dissertation on striped bass and it was like yoda just got in the boat you know what i mean holy shit and this guy i mean i just it was i mean it was probably the worst day of guiding i'd ever had because i could have cared less if we caught any trout i was just grilling this guy unscrewed top of his head oh dude just like i don't you you ever watch that tv show heroes yeah the dude that eats the brains and then yeah, yeah i was like i'm just gonna eat your brain but uh so I started talking to him about flies and he's a fly fisherman and he, and a good fly tire, really good fly tire. And he's like, look, dude, like the way a striper in, interacts with this world is it has two, it has the lateral lines. It, it senses and hunts pressure waves. Okay. So things move through the water in different ways. And therefore animals that sense pressure with lateral lines interpret whatever that is through the water in different ways. You know, a pike minnow moves differently than a crayfish, you know, um, a bluegill moves differently than a pike minnow yeah. based on the water displacement and the swim pattern. And is it, would it be correct to think about this, this lateral line sensitivity is kind of like a bat, how a bat sonar pings I, I things, would think but in so. reverse? I, I think it's in reverse. Yeah. It's, because you they know, don't, the, they don't send a ping out. It's no, all the passive. water displacement. It's all passive. Yeah. The water displacement that is created by the motion and yeah. shape of that fish creates the disturbance yeah, so but it's still a wave it's still absolutely. a sound wave a water wave it's mm-hmm. still the same way it's a wavelength yeah. of some sort yeah. and so you know i kind of described how we fish in the water conditions that we fish in the river and he's like oh your fish feel your fly before they ever see it what yeah and you, you got to think on a, on a big flat on the sack yeah like you cast out and you strip you know how many times are you getting eaten at the boat or within five feet from the boat. Right, a lot. A lot. Yeah. So you pulled that. It's not like that fish was five feet from the boat, and then all of a sudden it 
your fly got ripped right into right. it. You know, stripers are not structure feeders. Yeah, it's kind of like on when you're watching like an FBI or CIA movie and, and the guy the terrorist makes the phone call and yeah. they like they start yeah. tracking that motherfucker yeah. down. And, exactly. Yeah. So you know, and I I mean I spend a whole lot of time watching flies get ripped through the water for stripers and I started you know thinking about this and the most of my evidence was right in line with that. And what this guy said is he's like, look, dude, the first sensory, the first experience a a striper has with any bait, unless it is actively like on a school of bait feeding, you know, like in the middle of a school of bait. But then his thing was he had to find that school of bait to feed on it. Yeah. Is he feels your fly, you know? And if that fly doesn't, the way it moves through the water, the pressure waves it sends off doesn't entice him, then he ain't even getting a look at it. It could be the most beautiful pike minnow imitation in the world, but if he doesn't like the way that that fly moves through the water, then it's a no-go from the beginning, you know? So... And I'm like, well, what about, you know, what about color and, you know, profile? He said, you know, the next thing is if it moves on the fly, it's going to see the profile. So the profile has got to be good, but the profile also dictates this, how it pushes water. So right. like you either get it right or you don't. And he's like, the right. last thing that fish does is see your fly. Yeah. Within a foot or two or exactly. three, whatever the visibility yeah. is. He's yeah. like, that fish has made up its mind that it's going to eat your fly. Yeah. You know? The flip side of that is too, is like how many times have you had a big fish pull off your fly at the boat? You know, like I can't even tell you how many times I've had just monsters and I don't know, you know, did they see the boat yeah, or did I've they finally wondered, see you, the fly? Do they and, get more aggressive because they see this big structure that this thing's going to and they're worried about getting it getting away? Uh, you know, there's uh, the, the yeah, other thing too. it's cover or something, you know. I, I'm not sure. You know, the one thing that I, I, one of my, you know, you talk about movement of the fly and that, that has a whole predication of, uh, you know, the, the way it sends off. You know, my, kind of my mentor striper fishing was Mike Costello and, you know, Mikey, you know, it's all about the strip, right? Like that's, you know, you can have guys in your boat that with the same exact rod, same exact line, same exact fly. And one guy's smashing fish mm-hmm. and the other guy's not catching any And it. It's the way the guy's moving the fly. That's the pressure wave sending off. That's what's pulling the fish. That, that the way that fly is moving through the water is pulling fish. Yeah. The other way isn't like every time I go and fish with you, I, I mean, I do look at your flies, obviously, but yeah. the main thing I watch is your retrieve. Oh, that dude, that's it. And I like, watch, I look at the, I look at what our water conditions are, how much, how deep we are, yeah. what the temp is. And then I just watch your retrieve. And that's, I mean, that's not that I'm, look, we all learn from the people that come before us and that teach us. I mean, I, I watch if I'm in the boat with John Sherman or Costello, like two of my best friends, my peers, you know. I still watch everything they do, you know, because like everybody's evolving. Yeah. Like every, yeah, you, you just you don't, know. you don't like hit a point and fucking, yeah. Stop, like, you, you, you know, getting good. watching Mikey fish and, and that's another thing. Like Costello won't fish a fly without a rattle. Like he s- will not, he swears by it. It's his thing. And watching that dude fish a rattle clouser, a dotchy rattle clouser. Like it's like watching a freaking vacuum cleaner go through. It just sucks everything to it. And I could fish the same fly on the same line and the same rod and like Mike, he'll smoke me just cause he knows how to move it. Like, well, I imagine it's kind of like, um, I don't know if strum's the right word, but you know, when it, people, if you give somebody the cello and they're, oh, absolutely. And, they're, and they're both elite players, but there's one, one person that gets the booking more oh, than the other totally, one. Totally. It's because the strum, twinkle, is that right? Twinkle is that, those is it strings? Is strum or, I don't, I mean, I, don't I, I mean, I it was you music. I mean, you get my point. Though. Yeah, totally. You know, like yeah. there's some musicians that can make a simple G chord sound like an orchestra. Yeah, you you're know? a musician. You know, yeah, and exactly that's what I'm what saying. I'm that about. I know exactly yeah. what you're talking about. So is it like that? I would think so. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, but so sitting in the drift boat with a guy for uh, this guy, it really changed how I thought about striper flies and confirmed some of the stuff I was doing. You know, it's like at the time it was like, well, we fish big bulky flies in 
the winter and in crappy off color water conditions, it's like, well, that pushes more water. That's the water is a, you know, when there's sediment in the water, the water is denser. So Mm -hmm. things don't, you know, your skinny little, you know, chartreuse over white's not going to push water like your, you know, big bulky black and purple thing, you know, so you got to push more water when there's sediment in the water, you know, it's a lot of people think, oh, you got to fish big flies in off color water so they can see it. No, it's because you got to push more water for them to find it. It's a trip. You know, and, you know, I've messed with that. It's like all fish, all fish, all black sparse flies in the middle of summer and all fish big bulky as get up flies in muddy January water in white. I mean, and if you look at any of the guys, you know, look at the glide baits that guys throw in the winter. And for stripers. Yeah. And I just saw some come through my feed on Instagram. And they're that's, white. that's what I noticed. They, yeah. They're every white. Every single one of them are white. Every single one of big. them is white because it has nothing to do with the color. It's how that thing moves through the water. Hmm. Like it's those guys. Don't, I mean, white, black, purple, pink. Do you, well, let, let's talk rattles for a second. Yeah. Um, do you fish them all the time too? If no. Not, why? So, um, I, so well, let's back up. Let's talk about what a rattle is for the, yeah. For, so for the, for the uh, there's a bunch of different types know. of rattles, but basically what all rattles are at some point in a construction method is it's a fixed BB, you know, it looks like a, uh, basically shot from a shotgun. And we're talking big striper flies guys. Yeah. And it's fixed at the end of a cylinder. And then there's usually two loose BBs in that cylinder that bang back and forth and yeah. make noise. And they're not a fly fishing thing. I mean, guys have been putting rat. I mean, you shake any bass bait, it's got rattles yeah. in it, you know, and, um, and you just tie it right down in the shape. Yeah. You tie you it. Start. There's a lot of different theories about where you tie it in the fly, you know, like, um, a dachi ties all his rattles on the inside. Um, like actually in between the hook point and the shank on the inside. In be- the gap. Yeah. In the gap. Hmm. because one of the problems with a rattle is a lot of people traditionally tie a rattle on the bottom, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and the ra- the rattle is basically a huge air pocket. Mm-hmm. And so what happens is that air pocket floats. So it'll come up and the fly will turn sideways. On the, kind of like at the apex of the, as, of the strip. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, one of the solutions to that is tying it on the inside. Um, you got fish bigger hook. I don't tie mine that I, I don't tie mine that way, but I have a lot of Steve's flies and they work. It's the right way to do it, to be honest with you. Like I've messed with many, I've put, you know, tungsten tape on the bottom of my rattles and put them on the bottom of the fly. It just, you still get that turn, that flip over at the apex of the strip. If you tie them on the bottom, even with lead eyes. Hmm. Um, now does it matter? I don't know. Um, I kind of think it, you know, if you go with the theory, the the predation theory that a predator likes things that look wounded. Yeah, it, you know, there, it could you work. You may want it to go <laughs> yeah. on its side sometimes. I, I, I know look, on bass. Like, yeah, again, this one fly I was talking about, they'll mash it if it's on its if it just happens to like go off canter a little bit. Totally, that's when they and, uh, that's when they rip it. I I don't fit. To, you know, to get back to your original question, yeah. like I don't fish enough rattles to have. Um, a huge plethora of data to have a true get opinion. Of. Of them, huh? Oh yeah, I mean, yeah, you've been yeah. telling me this for yeah. like three years. <laughs> so we've tried. It's well, oh, Mikey's maybe, about as hard to pin down yeah, as a twenty twenty. Yeah, um, happen. I I fish rattles in the spring. the The migratory fish seem to eat rattles like want a rattle this spring. Hmm. Um, it was like if you didn't have a rattle, you weren't catching fish. And if you did, you are so, but then the resident fish that we fish for probably the most, like it doesn't seem to make a difference one way or another. Yeah. Um, and you know, Mikey's theory behind the rattle is that it sounds like a crayfish. It sends off the pressure that a crayfish makes. From when an it's and- exactly. And that certain yes. areas that he fishes in the Delta, that's the main food source is crayfish. And I think mm. our fish 
in the river eat way more fish soft shit yeah, yeah. than they do crayfish so that's Makes his sense. theory i you know i don't know i i think it just sends off a different pattern if that's the case then you should be watching a lot of a video of crayfish swimming if you want to figure out his cadence on oh his dude script. mikey's if there's somebody posted on instagram i don't know it may have been steve if you look at adachi's instagram they they threw up a video of him fishing a rattle clouser and it's, oh really yeah and it's not what most people would do yeah. I'm going to have to get up. Yeah, but search that out. Adachi. Mikey probably doesn't want that out. But if you look at Adachi, search, search up Steve Adachi. Okay. Yeah. Steve. And Steve's flies, you can buy Steve's flies. Steve's flies, he sells his flies through uh, Lost Coast Outfitters. He oh, works cool. there. Oh. Yeah. Cool. G- great source for, you know, one of the few places that will commercially sell striper flies. Okay, good yeah. to know. Yeah. Or they're probably on their website too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. You can get them on Lost Coast's website. They got them up there for sale. He's got a bunch of really cool, cool. color combinations and stuff. Well, so. we're in an hour and 15. Are you still feeling, are you good? I'm good. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to go watch uh, Star Wars tonight. Are you? Yeah, I haven't heard shit about it. Like I, I intentionally have not. So the guys were talking about it I a just, little bit at BAM practice tonight. Uh, and I was kind of like. Yeah, I just Silence. shut it. Yeah, I'm going to go at like 7 and 45. Yeah. No, I just yeah. told the family I'd take them out to dinner. So That's we're cool. good. Okay. Um, where else can we? So we talked about the the pressure wave. We, we touched Is that kind of what you were wanting? Is yeah, man. Saying? Yeah, like I, I just wanted to. It, it's more it's gotten the, into the theory of time which is kind of yeah. cool because we haven't really done that before you know okay so that's that's good we can talk about hooks yeah let's do that you okay. want to start with the small ones and then go up to yeah the big yeah, ones? yeah yeah okay. yeah so um another thing that um has really exploded over the last couple of years is the the different uh, hooks that are out there mm-hmm. you know um there's I feel like an old fogey even when I look at some of these hooks. You know, Matt Matt Calise, who's a dear friend of mine, is you know he's like the kid that knows every band that comes out before like anyone knows who it is. He'd and work in the record shop. If yeah, exactly. Shop totally, before. totally. Yeah. Um. So he's always throwing new hooks at me and like these you know new hook companies that are coming out and um. I probably should take better advantage of it in the fact that the hook design or the hook is really the, the basis of what that fly is going to look at, look like the silhouette. And then what is that fly going to do when it's fished? You know, Mm -hmm. um, one of the, the things I learned really early on is, you know, when I was, when I first started kind of coming up with some caddis patterns and still now, like the, uh, there's a hook, basically a 2457 basically a it's a tmco 24 2457 yeah it's basically the normal scud hook it's got a down eye okay and uh mercer started tying the z-wing caddis on that hook i'm pretty sure that's the one he tied it on or similar and i was coming up with a i needed a, a fly for the yuba and the feather when i was guiding out there a ton that i could swing or that i could dead drift okay and because I didn't want to have to tie flies, flies that I could swing and then flies that I could dead drift. I was trying mm-hmm. to be efficient about this. And, you mean a guide fly? Yeah, totally a guide fly. Yeah. Like, um, and I, I was swinging the, the 2457 and, it, and it, it didn't have a really good, it didn't track really well because of that down eye. So if you're, you know, you're swinging for a caddis hatch or swinging caddis pupa, like it would almost ride based on that down eye, like nose down. And I'm like, you know, there's no caddis that swims to the surface from the rocks with its face down, like they're up. And I found a hook called a 2488. And these are by no means new hooks, but the 2048 had a straight eye and a curved shank. Well, it was like the game changer. It was like, now this fly fishes on a dead drift and now this fly fish is on a swing and all you had to do was basically straighten out the eye and Hmm. paying attention to how hooks you know the 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 direction of the eye the angle of the eye the length of the hook shank the bend all these type of things are incredibly important because that's like the skeleton of the fly yeah i didn't i didn't ever think about 
a swim tank for these small nymphs. But oh, God. that makes me be like, because I was like, oh, how are you supposed to do, like, you know, field test this efficiently? And yeah. The, and the best way to do it would be a, a tank, I guess. Absolutely. Right? So, like, you don't have to actually go out to the river. To no, see this no. Thing. And I, I would just, like, uh, it's, I'd fill up my bathtub, dude. Yeah. Like, you know, I, I would, that's, I didn't use my bathtub. It was a fly tank and it was literally yeah. just full of water. And I would, and I would even to the point where I would like turn on the bathtub and float nymphs under indicators and like, look, yeah. because it, it, it and you don't have to look long. It's not like it, some huge, you know, close look, but like, you know, if your stonefly nymph doesn't drift right based on the way that it's attached to the tippet, like, that's kind of a deal abort. Yeah. That's kind of an abort. You know, I mean, um, there was a really, um, for a long time, there was a, a TM co hook called a 200 R that a lot of people were tying snow stone flies on and it had a straight eye. The hook would bend out. It had issues, but flies looked really good on it. Like it looked, they just looked good, but the straight eye on that, that pattern, it wouldn't drift right. Like it didn't, you could swing a fly on it, but it, the, it just didn't drift right. And there's so many, you know, uh, fire hole sticks and Eric's and all these kind of new startup company. I don't even know if they're startup anymore. I mean, I think they're pretty well established, like, um, just simple changes, little tweaks to different types of patterns and stuff. I mean, it, it's, it's almost mind numbing of like what just, putting a pheasant tail on a different hook changes the whole deal. Mm. You know, like I think, you know, a lot of people are fishing jigged hooks and all that type of stuff. It's like, I think a lot of reasons that some of the jig hooked flies fish is the fact that they just look different than what the fish, you know, if you're going to tie a PT on a jig hook, it's the pattern works. They're, they're great for check nymphs, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, the pattern works and it just looks a little different in how it's presented. So, yeah. I don't think, I think people just, it's another one of those things of like, what, what hook do you use for what fly? Like, you know, um, you know, I use a lot of dry fly hooks for my mayfly nymphs because they're thin, you know, and a lot of people are like, well, why do you do that? They're fine. It's like, well, if a dry fly is going to hold a 20 inch (laughs) trout, (laughs) like a nymph, it's going to work. It's the same thing. So, um, you know, it allows you to tie a trim fly, you know, cause it's not a, you know, three yeah. X wire hook, you know? So yeah, I just, I've, I found that I've kind of like just tie striper flies and buy everything else. Cause <laughs> yeah, I, a don't have the patience, B the dexterity or C the vision. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I still spend a lot of time tying trout flies and for the Yuba in particular, that's about where I do most of my trout fishing. And, and what keeps me, I think in the game on the trout fly world is that, the Yuba fish are incredibly picky. Yeah. So you gotta, you know, you gotta think about it and yeah, the, the tie in striper flies is way funner. And, but I also, there's a, I started tying trout flies and getting into all this stuff that we've talked about because I guess when I started fly fishing and guiding, I always assumed that everyone else out there was better than I was. And so I had to come up with something that set me apart or gave me that edge, Mm -hmm. you know? And I think that still applies to everything, you know, like if you go fish the pit, you go fish the upper sack, you go fish the lower sack, you go fish anywhere in California, nine times out of 10, those fish have seen every freaking freaking fly. Yeah. There's 20 dudes that are a better angler than you and me that fished it in the last 48 hours. Yeah. Like I, how are you going to put yourself ahead of that? So that this point you're making about um, humility, I guess, yeah. is <laughs> in this sport, you absolutely have to have it in like big heaping spoonfuls. Oh, God. You're, you're not going to yeah. learn near as fast yeah. as, you know, just get out of your own way, basically. Oh, dude. Check your ego. Yeah. No, I mean, it, it's, um, yeah. And I mean, I have to do that. We all have to do that. I mean, but y- you're right, dude. It's the, the, the reality is that so much of success in the sport is completely out of our control. You know what I mean? Like to be a six, you know, I've guided for the 
I don't know, 20 some years now. And I've fished my entire life and spent my entire life on the water. And I'd be ignorant to think that the times that I've done really well are because of anything that I had to do with it or just kind of figuring it out and all the things coming together. You know, like, Mm -hmm. I think, you know, realistically, I've solved a lot of problems. I've come up with great flies. I've learned a lot of stuff. I've come up with all sorts of ways to create the problem of putting fish in the boat on a day-to-day basis. But when it really comes down to it, that fish eating your fly, you only have so much control over. And in the long run, yeah, you don't have much control over that. You know, because, I mean, how many times have you seen fish eat horrible looking flies or... You know, I, I, I just a couple of weeks ago, I had a, a girl within five days of this girl, I probably had two of the best striper anglers that I guide, um, in my boat fish hard for two days for a big fish, you know, I mean, just better. I mean, probably better anglers than I am like just good anglers and just, it didn't happen. Like we couldn't find them I and mean, we got plenty of good fish, but we didn't get the fish that they were there for. Yeah. And, you know, this girl who's never striper fished in her entire life gets up on the front of the boat, throws like a 30-foot cast on her first cast, looks like a 22-pound fish. It's like, that's not how that's supposed to happen. I you know? fished hard all year and my best was 12. I'm so <laughs> yeah. fucking pissed. So, like, it, 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 you know, the best laid plans, right? You know what I mean? Yeah. So, Well, it's like, you know, it, it's like... The person that buys a thousand lottery tickets and does and gets like a five dollar scratch or whatever. Oh, and then, totally. And totally. then the person the next day goes into the same Seven Eleven, buys one, <laughs> and fucking <laughs> and doesn't work a day in his life. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, so, so all I mean, that said, luck all, plays into it too. Yeah, just all the all the stuff I talk about as well too. As as anal as I get about this, I also have to back myself up and be like, dude, really? Like, they'll eat a thread, Mitch. Like, <laughs> yeah, you know. So yeah, I mean, I've caught a fish on a fly that was just tattered and had oh totally string hanging off of it. yeah it's so like, it, screw it's, it it's almost the end of the day and i don't yeah. want to change it out so you throw it back and yeah, we'll back. How, totally how much does any of this really matter i, I think it's uh you know you, you just i think the more you know and the more you understand and the more you pay attention to stuff the better the better or i guess the more often you put yourself in position to be successful yeah you know what I mean? The more often you are there to adapt, the more often you are capable of adapting to the changes, adapting to the situation and making the moves that give you the opportunity to be successful. Yeah. We, um, we'll probably leave it on that, but I want to, sure. there's one, there's one yeah. thing, uh, when we're talking about just, you know, the evolution of fly, fly time material and everything. Yeah. We did this, we did this podcast, um, this gentleman had written up a, a pretty killer essay on the origins of high stick nymphing. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I listened to that one. Yeah. So he came on and w- one of the things was when, um, I think it was the wind too, um, when they, they kind of, you know, arguably are ones that pioneered high yeah. stick nymphing, at least uh, in this region. Yeah. Um, they used burlap on the flies. Like the, well, on there's the gotta be the your body material. The, the, the famous fly fisherman in Dunsmere, he called the fly the burlap. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, from from them. Ted, yeah, so there was Faye. Yeah, and Ted Talon Talon Dolly was kind yeah. of he was kind of the bridge between the the indigenous peoples gotcha. and the fishing methods, and then when it got popularized. Yeah, and um, yeah, so you know, go figure. Yeah, they, it, why think, would they? It, it gets back down to your original thing. It's like that's probably profile. Totally, right? Totally, and it moves. It looks yeah. good. It looks fishy. Yeah, yeah. If you uh, if you want to laugh, there's the, the, um, Ted Fay. There's some videos of him on on um, the internet or not on YouTube. Yeah, old school stuff. It's it's not black and white, but it's super grainy. It's, oh, that's you know, so shot good. Five by six or whatever with somebody's um, like VHS camera. Yeah, but he's just he's in uh, he's in the upper sack and he's just ripping fish and he's like, I got that one in the snot locker. <laughs> and, you know, his camera's like all shaky and he's, the dude's just ripping fish left and right. That's and, awesome. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Cool. Uh, all right, sweet. Well, I want to um, have a few messages from the sponsors while I'm. Oh yeah, go about for it. it. So the uh, for, for our sponsor Caltrout, they would like. Um, I'm just gonna read this uh, message from them really quick. Donate to Caltrout today to ensure re- resilient wild fish thrive in healthy waters for a better California by texting Barbless 
to 26989. Can you read that? Because I want to make sure that I got that right because it's really blurry for me. I can't read 2L26989. 26989. Okay, thank you. Jeez. Old age and dry eyes, man. Okay, once again, that text, text to Barbless 26989. Thank you, and thank you, Cal Trout, for supporting this show for the last four months. Uh, you guys have been awesome for us. And um, anything that you want to announce before we cut people loose? No, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for listening and supporting what these guys are doing. Um, you can check me out at hgbflyfishing.com. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to email me and ask away. And Cast Hope. Yeah, Cast Hope. Check out Cast Hope at casthope.org or uh, our uh, bass fishing organization we run at calbassunion.com. Sweet. So, enjoy. Thanks. Have a good winter. <laughs> Thanks for listening. If you guys like this episode and want to uh, support the show, you can um, go to gear.barbless.co and, and pull down a hat. We still have some fr- left over from Christmas. So there's plenty of stuff there on the site. Thanks for listening. Valentine's gifts. All right, fellas. Thanks. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next week. Special thanks to our sponsors. Without them, this show would not be possible. And thanks for listening. If you have ideas or any questions for the show, send an email to fishon at barbless.co or join our Facebook group at facebook.com slash the barbless podcast and tap on the visit group link. Also be sure to follow us on Instagram at barbless.co or find us on YouTube. Thanks for listening.